All right. Hello and welcome to Smile Diaries. I am Dr. Gita Harb. And I have on today this amazing guest who actually is joining us all the way from down under from Australia, Daniel Shedyat. He is the author of The Modern Breakup Book, a bestseller. Um, you can find it anywhere you find books on Amazon. And he is joining us today all the way from Australia. It's super early right now. Hi, Daniel. You got me up in the dark. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I very, I very, I very rarely wake up at, in the dark. Uh, you woke up for me. Up. <laughs> I woke up. I woke up. That's but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been cold here. Yeah, we were just chatting. You were saying how cold it is. So, and I and completely forgot that it's your actually your winter, and our summer. So it is. That's and I didn't realize it, it gets that yeah. cold in Australia. So that's. That's crazy. You need to move no to OC. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Everyone's got this perception that we're uh, that we're sunny all the time and we go surfing all the time, and uh-huh. <clears throat> that's uh, not the case. It's not the case. It's cold. It it is here, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> no, see. Um, yeah, I know. I got to move. Yes. Well, we'll be happy to have you here. Um, so, Daniel, tell me a little bit. Um, I know your your book is an amazing bestseller, and it's such an amazing book. It's about you know breakups, and you've also written another book. But before we jump into that and discuss all of that, I want to know a little bit about your background. Um, so tell us a little bit about where you grow up and how did you grow up, and um, a little bit about you. Yeah, well, uh, I grew up in Melbourne, where I am now. Mm-hmm. Traveled so much throughout my life, but. I think uh, I'll probably start from when I was at university or else we're going to be here for yeah, forever. a few months. <laughs> <speaking>. <laughs> no worries. So, yeah, I was um, I was doing a commerce degree at university and I think I was doing that because I, there's always there's this misconception that you have to have this piece of paper in life, you know, which is this uh, degree, a university Correct. degree to be successful. And I, when I was growing up, I think there was less of this free thought, you know, be whatever you want to be. We were really hounded at school. Like if you don't go to university, if you don't get a degree, you're basically nothing. So Correct. I did this commerce degree because I thought that's what was going to fulfill me in life. And while I was at university, there was a lecturer who was there and he he was an accountant. So that's what I was going, that's what I was majoring in. And he was speaking about uh, how he's got this job and he was probably in his late fifties and he was making X amount of money and traveling the world and everyone was sort of looking around and going, oh yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And I just had this, this gut feeling that this is just not for me. I was just like this, I just don't want this from my life. I don't want to work for someone for starters. I want to find my own way. Um, and it just sounded boring. What, what year honest. were you in <laughs> Nothing school? against accountants, I'm just not that kind of person. Yeah. Sorry? What year were you in school at that point when you realized that? Were you first oh, that year, was second? My, that was my first. That was first my year. first year at uni. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was probably about six months in, and mm-hmm. um, I stuck it out for a little while. But I remember I picked up my books. I stuck it out for that first six months, even though I wasn't liking it. And I remember I picked up my books in that lecture, and I just had this epiphany moment. And I was only young, and it was stupid and it was crazy. I probably wouldn't advise this to everybody, <laughs> but I picked up my books and I never went back. No and way. I had, oh, wow. Yeah, I, pi- I literally picked up my books. I was just looking around and I made this decision. I closed them. I went home. I was living with my parents at the time. And I'm like, I've uh, I've left uni. And they're like, oh, yeah, what, what, what time are you going back? <laughs> and I was they're like, like, are you on vacation? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, are you in your lunch break? Or? <laughs> I'm like, no, I've, actu- I've actually, I've left. And, For you good. Know, um, yeah, I think my, my mum was, was always, she was a little bit worried, but she was like, I, I trust you. And, you know, yeah. my mum has always been there. My dad is very supportive in everything that I do, but he gave me the sit down and was like, are you sure? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, what are you going to do? And I didn't know and I didn't have a clue. I just knew that I didn't want to be there. So you could say I've pretty much winged my whole life, but um, mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. they're just risks that I've gone with my gut feeling. So I left uni and I had all these different jobs. I had marketing jobs and sales jobs and yeah. working on train tracks and just everything you could imagine. 
Stop, yeah. but that, that annoying person in the middle of a shopping center that tries to get you to buy things and sign up for things. I was that. That's you. So I, I that just, was you. That, 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 that was me. I hated it. I hated it because I was like, I hate I can being imagine. stuck myself. But, yeah. but you do what you do, right? You do what you Correct. do to survive. And um, I just crashed really hard in my life. I had no direction. I didn't know where I was going. Um, I was abusing my body with substances when I was partying and and I remember I had this um, epiphany moment, I guess, and everything just dawned on me and I hit rock bottom, I guess you could say. Um, but in my, in my first book, I call it a point of awareness. Mm -hmm. I don't actually like to use that term uh, rock bottom because I think that is a point where, you know, p you, people think that you're right at the bottom, but I think you've hit this point where you're aware mm -hmm. that you need to change. And I think that's if you look at it from a negative to a zero and then getting into the positives, yeah. I think you're at that zero point. That's not bad because you might have been at all these negative points before that. Right. So you might actually be growing and I think it's a great place to be. And how long did and I it- I hit that moment and- mm -hmm. How long did, yeah. like after how many years did you reach that moment? Did you get to that moment where you're like, oh my God, this is, this is, I'm at my lowest and I got it. And you felt uh, that epiphany. I've, I've probably hit it a- yeah, I've probably hit it a couple of times since as well because mm -hmm. life throws so many things at you. Um, however, that was, I was, I think I was 23. Okay. Then. So it was after a Europe trip that I went on. Yeah. A big party Europe trip. And I had a clothing business uh, mm -hmm. with my brother and that went down around that same time. And I hit rock bottom and I, I just, I woke up. I became awake, awakened in that time. And uh, I just started to realize the power that my thoughts had in my life. And it was funny when I had sort of lost everything and I felt like I was at this rock bottom place in my life was where I truly found fulfillment. And I just became wow. comfortable with not knowing where I was going or anything like that. I just was in the moment and just decided to live. And that's when I, that's when I started writing. And I had this calling just to write and I'd never been a writer. If you asked me what I wanted to do in school, I never ever would have said writer. It probably would have been, wouldn't have even been on the list. Right. Um, That's amazing so life, that you just life. just started writing just like that. I just started writing. Yeah. And I was, it, it felt like someone had pulled the cloth from my eyes and I just saw everything so clearly. I could see my thoughts. I thought I was going crazy. I'd be waking up at three in the morning because something was telling me to write down all these new things that I was discovering within myself. And I had friends that were sort of a little bit more evolved, I guess, spiritually than me saying, oh, you're being awakened and, you know, you yeah. should listen to this person and you should, re you should read this book. I never read books. I didn't listen to anybody. I didn't know what was happening to me. And to be honest, it was a little bit scary. But um, I definitely know something was coming through me and before I knew it, I had 170,000 words written out. Oh, wow. Who Says You Can't You Do, my first book. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And um, and so how did you how did you get that book all together? Like, what was the process like, and how long did it take you to to get it out and get it published and all of that stuff? Yeah, you learn as you go. That's my advice to every single person who ever asks me. I had no idea. I had no one mentoring me. I googled everything. <laughs> yeah. I had just. I I probably. I don't know if you guys call them exercise books. Mm -hmm. Just like notepads. We yeah. call them exercise books. Okay. Just those yeah. A4 we call them notepads. That you, that <laughs> notepads. Yeah. We call yeah. them exercise books here. I don't know why, but um. Yeah. I had probably ten of those written out, and before wow. I knew that, I should actually be typing this on the computer because I'm going to have to transfer everything one day. <laughs> at um, some but point. But I had just everything <laughs> at some point. Yeah. So I'd written everything out, and. I just compiled it all yeah. together eventually. I was like, okay, so that part goes with that part and then that part goes, and then I started doing headers on everything. So like, how can I break all this down? So it was yeah. just, uh, I say that you become like a computer. You become like a supercomputer when you're writing a book. Everything just comes together and you're like a mathematician with words. It's mm -hmm. a very strange journey. And you know, there were things that I had at the end of the book that ended up being at the start. So the editing process is huge. Um, so it's about three and a half years four years before I, but I wasn't writing religiously every single day. I right. was someone who just, I, you know, I wrote it when I felt it, but then there were times where I was like, okay, I really need to do work on this now. Um, and yeah, I couldn't even find an editor. So no one would edit my book. They said that, it, you know, they, one person politely said, I was doing actually a PT mm -hmm. job at the time, personal training job. Mm -hmm. And I left it to finish the book. Mm -hmm. And I told this, uh, one of the most famous editors in Victoria, one of the best editors here, and she um, was like, look, I don't really want to be the one to tell you this, but I like basically don't leave your day job 
oh, because no. I don't think, yeah. This yeah, is not going no, no, anywhere. intense. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was like, I just don't, you know, she, I think she was doing it like to sort of look out for me, like, yeah. like don't leave your job. Do you know what I mean? Right, just, right. She didn't believe it. And, but, and I remember I was at the park and I was running and I, I ran until I literally was physically sick and crying because I'd worked three years on this and I'd just oh. been rejected by every editor. They didn't even want to edit my book and I was paying them because I wanted to self-publish. That's crazy. Initially, and um, and I remember something just clicked in me and I went home and restructured the whole book and wow. got signed by Penguin Random House a year later. Oh my God, that's amazing. So what did, what did you change about the book that you, all of a sudden, it worked? Um, I, I decided to take the criticism that she gave me. She only gave me a little bit of criticism, to mm. be honest. I felt like she could have probably given me more rather than just yeah. shut me down. Yeah. But that's okay. I was always going to find a way. Uh, it was, I, I knew that it was my calling because I didn't choose it to some degree. I felt like it chose me. Right. Um, so uh, what, what did I change? I guess everything that I could, everything that I went back over and said, I thought this was finished and every author and every writer has this perception that when they finish a script that it's finished. It's never finished then, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, you that's can, when you you're can, on a high, you think. Right. You can write forever and you yes. can change things forever and you can edit forever, right? For it, sure. It, it, it doesn't For ever sure. stop. For sure, but there's a massive, so. you, know, you, know when it, you know when it's coming to the end. And I say this because this is from, I've actually written a movie script as well, which um, have just finished it not long ago. So it was the same process you know when it's nearly at the end because the editing process becomes less and less. Right. So you know, you're like, You're okay, I'm just less. changing things now to change them. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's amazing. Um, and tell me a little bit about, I want to dig a little deeper into that awakening that you had and that feeling that you had. And, um, and you know, we were talking over the phone and, and you mentioned, you know, you felt God. You felt like there... God was talking to you and you felt, you know, God was within mm. you. What was that like? How did that, how did you feel that? How did you, how did you feel that God was sending you a message or, you know, God was inside of you? I felt, I felt light. I just questioned, I felt connected with everything. And I started to realize not just spiritually, scientifically as well, that we are all connected. Mm -hmm. And I started to put all the pieces of the puzzle together of my life. And I re was remembering, um, and I don't go to church that much anymore. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm gonna Me neither. To church all the time. But, I, but <laughs> yeah. when I was, I know, but when I was young, yeah. when I was young, um, I was at church and I remember my mum used to make us go every Sunday, you know, she's not going to go, get up, I go to church. But yeah. I, and I would, and I remember I was praying and I was, um, I was probably in my early twenties at the time. And I prayed to God. It was when I felt really lost. And I was like, please, God, just show me the way. Just just show me and I will dedicate my life to it. And it took years and years. And I felt like when I was awakened and I felt this love, and I think that's what God is, it's love. And it's complete love for everything and everybody. It's not love for um, a job or love for your situation because your situation is never going to be great. You know, it's it's they're gonna it's gonna chop and change. Happiness is right. is momentary. It doesn't last. This mm -hmm. happiness feeling that we're all trying to hold on to. So that was what it was really. It was a deep sense of love and appreciation for being alive. And I knew that was God, light, energy, whatever you want to call it, the universe. Um, and God showed me my connection with the universe, and showed me that I had the power to create my own life. And I think that's where this misconception of God to mm -hmm. me where it comes in that God is just giving all these, that God is a separate entity, just giving everyone all these things when they ask for them. I don't believe that. I think you have the power to create your own life. A part of God is within you and you have that power to create and to manifest. And we're all co-creators in all of this. And when you find that power, you need to, you need to harness it because that is the highest plane of being. That is the truth. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, we all walk around and we don't really like dig deep to really feel that. I think we're all so busy with everyday life and running around and doing that, that I think it does take a moment where your life crashes and you are at your worst when you start to actually, you're looking for it, right? Um, and for then sure. it just, and then you feel it because you're, you're in need of it and you're looking for it. But 
when your life is just normal and everything's going good, you're really not digging for that deep meaning and that love and the all home message and everything. So, and I think that's that's probably where you you know you had to get to your lowest moment that that's you right. had to feel it, right? Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, tell me a little bit about um, tell me a little bit about your second book. I want to kind of get into that, which is your modern breakup book. And give us a yeah. little history on how did that come about? Oh, don't ask. <laughs> no, no, don't tell us details. No, no. you don't need to tell us no, relationship no, no. details. No, no, yeah. no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, no well, do you know, it, uh, I actually started writing the book um, yeah. a couple of years after a breakup. So it wasn't an emotional. Right. Uh, it didn't come from such an emotional place. Mm -hmm. It came more from a conscious place of like, I need to capture what is going on in modern dating and the book as much as it's called the modern breakup is very much more so about um dating yeah and in dating in the modern world it just i guess the uh the start was was the breakup that sort of made the main character amelia question everything about dating and her life even and what relationships even mean so that's where it stemmed. It stemmed from having conversations with people, remembering my breakups and realizing that everyone has gone through all these things and all the books and all the movies out there, I felt brushed over the breakup part. So you'd watch a movie and they'd get broken up with and they'd be sad yeah. for a little bit. And then, and then and, they and would nobody get over talks it and about it. go and meet someone <laughs> and, and they find love again, right? I think Silver Linings Playbook, that was really one of the, the ones of the scripts. And I think that's why it was so great that it actually captured the breakup and the crazy thoughts that this guy was having and and yeah. followed that journey because it was so real. It didn't just brush over it. And I felt like no one was really doing it. And right. I just really wanted to capture capture that, you know, because we do have crazy thoughts. We we do get really really egotistical in that time. Like, oh, I want them to want me more than I want them. And right, uh, right. You know, all that sort of stuff. Like yeah. we have those thoughts and it's they're not bad. It's just it's the process. And I really wanted to capture that process because I think it's raw and I think it's beautiful and I think the the awakening and the enlightenment that comes from a breakup is probably one of the greatest things on earth. I think mm -hmm. when we come out of that mm -hmm. and we become that lotus flower again or that yeah. butterfly, you know, whatever you want right. to describe it as, you just you just live and you feel life more than you've ever felt it and you feel an appreciation for life. It's like it's like overcoming a death. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've, I mean, you've gone through so much like heartbreak and darkness. And then, so when you, when you do get out of it, it feels like this just amazing life all over again. And you start to feel things and, and you're like, and where you, I'm sure you were at a point and we all, we're all been there where you're like, I'm never going to love again. I'm never going to trust again. I'm never going to sure. sure. have those feelings. I'm never going to find the right person. And, and, you know, eventually you will. So, um, yeah, how yeah. long did it take you to write the modern breakup book? And what was that about like for you? Years. Uh -huh. yeah. Three years. Okay. About three years from concept to creation. I say from concept to creation because I think with any writer, you're writing notes for so long. Right. It's not like just, I'm going to write a book and I'm just going to start writing page one. You know, it's yeah. like, if you do that, <laughs> Yeah. I, I admire you. Yeah. If you can do that, I admire you. Like that's probably a real writer. I don't, they probably are. I'm probably not a real writer. I uh -huh. just write. I don't know. There's people like Danielle Steele, you know, she's written God, right, I don't even right. know, 100 books. She's like, like she's a writer. Sentence one, chapter yeah, one. Yeah. I got this. Oh, so, <laughs> no, I, I bet if yeah. I had a conversation with her, she does the same thing. Yeah. But it's, um, yeah, it's it's a strange phenomenon the way, the way it all comes about. But yeah, I'd say about three and a half years. Yeah. Wow. It took. And so did you collect sort of, did you sit with friends and collect sort of stories from everyone and feelings and questions and things like that? And that's what you had in your mind where you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to put it uh, all together or, or was it mostly from yeah, your no, own not experience? Really. Yeah. So not really, to be honest. And that's the thing I think that is the misconception of the book. And I've had so many people like, oh, did you really write this part? Because there's girl characters in it. And the main <laughs> character is a girl. And did you yeah. did you sit down and interview people? But I honestly yeah. didn't. There was probably a couple of parts where yeah. I would send to my my girl cousin or girlfriends and just ask them, "Oh, what do you, do you think this is relatable?" And they're like, "Yes." And so I think it was just more me tapping into, I guess, this other energy, feminine energy, masculine energy, whatever it is. And yeah. you know, I was the mum in the character. I was the auntie in the character, the best friend, the, right. the, um, the guys in the character. So I think 
if you're a writer and you only mm -hmm. limit your ability to write one gender or one age, you're in trouble. Yeah. So it was it was my crazy mind, I guess, that came yeah. up with this whole thing. Well, you're you're amazing. I think that's incredible. Um, and Thank so you. tell me, you, I, I know you you talk a lot about um, obviously breakups and relationship and you you know, you talk about a lot of things, a lot of subjects in your Instagram. Um, tell me a little bit. I want to talk sort of hit on a couple of points. Um, and I've sort of asked a few friends actually before I did this podcast that are going through some breakups and dating and all of that. And I was like, hey, I'm, I'm having the author of the modern breakup book. Um, come on. So and I have a couple of friends that are actually in the process of, you know, they're dating narcissists. Right. And, um, you know, and, and you don't realize that you, you know, you don't realize sometimes the characteristics and stuff of, of a narcissist. Tell me, and I know you talk about that on your Instagram a lot. So tell me a little bit about what is your take on characteristic of a narcissist? How do you know you're dating? Yeah, well, like I've said. In, a narcissist. I know, yeah, I know you're well, not a therapist, well, well, but. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 no, no, like I said, and I say that to people, I'm not a psychologist, but yes. I think we've all ha had our experiences yeah. and, and we can, right, we can share. teach those, especially, you know, no matter what, no matter what we've gone through. Um, I think, in my opinion, it's, and whether we label it as a narcissist or whether we don't, right? I think it's someone who lacks the empathy to understand and to communicate and to act on your emotions and the mm -hmm. way you think. I think it's a very self-absorbed person. Um, and that's what I really think it is. It's the lack of empathy and it's the lack of communication and, uh, you know, we can always look and, and hang crap on these people and stuff like that. But I mean, I guess everyone needs healing. I'm sure that there's been times in my life mm -hmm. that people have thought certain things about me that I need healing from, you know, right. and probably I probably did at that time. So yeah. I guess we all do at certain stages of our life. But I think there are definitely mm -hmm. some extreme cases that people just take other people's emotions and their thoughts um, for granted and they take advantage of them. That's the main thing. It's when you know someone is hurting and you continue to hurt them. And it's like kicking the dog while they're down. Right. And to me, that's just so much weakness. Yeah. That just shows so much weakness in another human being. And um, I just think that there is no place to go from there. I think that if someone has proven to do that to you, mm -hmm. you get out and you, you never look back. That's my opinion because if someone has the potential to do that to you, mm -hmm. I think they're going to keep doing it. I think if they've done it before, and you know, people say, oh, people change. But I think if they're able to get to that place, then that's scary to me. And yeah. I, I, I'm just out. That's yeah. a checkout for me. And, and I feel like manipulation is a big part of that. You know, uh, being definitely, a narcissist definitely. and manipulating people, I think goes hand in, hand in hand. Because I feel like a narcissist is someone that manipulates every situation to not be their fault, right? To, to sort of turn yeah, it around sure. on you, blame you for certain things and sort of get out of it, right? Um, so tell, tell me a little bit about, you talk about a lot about trusting your instinct. Um, tell me a little bit about that. How do you know, how do you know your instinct? How do you know your instinct is right? And do you always trust your instinct? Do you, whatever you feel, do you just always go for it? Or do you ever doubt yourself? I doubt myself often and I kick myself often for not going with my gut feeling, but I've mm -hmm. learned to listen to it more and not just listen to it, act on it. Because we right. can hear it and you, it, there's this thing where like, you know, I know you've asked me, how do we know? Yeah. We just know. Yeah. We just know something's not right. And, but the, I, th I think there's a bigger issue that I'm going to get to after I explain this part, mm -hmm. because this is the bit that people really need to learn from. So I think the first part is that we feel this feeling. Like I know there was a, a moment and I won't get into too many details, but mm -hmm. there was a moment that I had with this person who I was meeting and it was the second day. And I was sort of in a situation where I was stuck with them somewhere, you mm -hmm. know, we were away, but I was, I just had this gut feeling that there's just something not right about this person. Like, it, yeah, like I said, I won't go into too many details, but I just knew right. that. And I, I almost repelled the energy so much that 
and not like she, she was a monster, but I just, I just was like, I just don't even want to be near this person. And it was so strong that I ended up having to say, I just want to go for a walk on my own. Yeah. Um, and I went on my own and stuff, but I started to feel guilty after that. Did See, you come this back? Is, this is did the, <laughs> I did. Okay. I did because I was there and I'm like, we've planned this thing and I'm not going to do that. And this sort of pride, integrity, and also I think the way I've been raised as well, which is to be mm-hmm. loving and understanding and caring, which might not always be a positive thing because there's boundaries, right? Right. And I, and I, I just, I went back and ended up getting myself in a worse situation. And because I felt guilty and then I excused things and excused things and excused things until you lose who you are. And I think that's the biggest thing. When in that moment I should have left and been like, I'm sorry, this isn't for me. Right. I needed to be stronger in that moment. I think that's what we all need to need yeah. to be. And But I think the second part of this is that when you have this gut feeling, you need to act on it. But also with the next person who you know is great, mm-hmm. give it a shot. Mm-hmm. This is the other thing. Don't assume that it's boring. Don't think just because you know, you've lost this little spark or whatever it is, that person might be funnier than you thought on the second time. So I was watching uh, Jewish Matchmaker uh-huh. on um, on Netflix and I remember watching it and, and I yeah. agreed with the matchmaker with what she said. She goes, even if on the first date you were like, oh, I don't really know, but I did like them and I would like to right. like, you know, because you knew they were a great person. If it's a hard yeah. no, it's a no. But if you're like, they're a great person, but I'm not really feeling it. Go on a second date, yeah. Because you just don't know. Go on a you third date. It's so hard to do. It is so hard to do. But I think you've got to do it, um, yeah. because that person might be funnier than you thought. But if you see really good qualities in someone and you know that they they're a beautiful person, when you see those that other side and you're like, no, this they've done something directly to me towards me, or this is definitely not aligned with my morals and values, that I'm I advocate like out, you know, right, but. If you know they're a great person, stop thinking that it's boring or yeah. you're not excited because you don't have that. You may get that feeling. You may get it on the second date. You're like, oh, my God, this person's so much cooler than I thought, yeah. you know, and I and connect with them so much more. So we're just quick to rule everyone out so quickly well, these days. We are. We are. And I feel like, well, when, you know, you go out on a date with someone and I haven't dated in so long. So but anyways, um, back when I did, you go out on a date with someone and then really from the first five to ten minutes, you kind of you you sort of judge you're like no i'm gonna be with that person or i can't be with that person right yeah and that's yeah, how it yeah. was for me anyways when i was dating back then because i would know from the first five to ten minutes like i can there's no way i see myself with that person and, and i'm yeah, guilty yeah, of yeah. that because i i don't remember ever giving anyone a second <laughs> sort of a second chance or coming back yeah. on a second date ever uh, going i'm gonna I try know. this again maybe the second time around it's gonna be better but um yeah, i don't, I don't I think know. i've ever done that so um but it's that's hard. that's a it's really hard. good tip. It's hard thing to do yeah. yeah, yeah, but I think it's I think it's just more so that uh, it's it's the after effect. This is what yeah. I'm talking about. It's like we have we have a great date with someone and it goes amazing and we love it and then everything and all our self sabotage comes in after that. We right. talk ourselves out of it. We go back on, you know, we go on to our fears and doubting ourselves and doubting yeah. that even if that person's going to continue to like us and we ruin it. So I think it's you know, working out yourself and discovering yourself. And I think this is the things that our parents and grandparents didn't do yeah. as much. Right. They didn't overthink everything. They had a good date with someone. They liked it. Mm-hmm. They wanted to go on a mm-hmm. second date and a third date and a fourth date. And then right. it happened. Yeah. They weren't like all these things were flooding in because we've dated so many people and all this trauma and all this baggage from every single other person that we've dated yeah. and flicking through on Tinder or Bumble yeah. all day long. And, and I all feel these like insecurities because that was, person didn't like back or... Oh, yeah. And it, and it was simple, yeah. simpler back then. It was like, hey, we know this guy and, you know, he's from the so-and-so and he's a friend of yeah. so-and-so or he's family friend. And, and you didn't really sort of think so much back then and compare so much because I think That's now right. with online dating and this and that and like every all these options that you have, you, you're almost like, you exactly. know, where do I go? What do I do? Is this the right person or not? So I feel like things back then were a lot simpler as well. And, you know, decisions yeah, were sure. a lot easier yeah. to make, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think I think that, you know, we, we, we just like we look at our parents and grandparents yeah. era as a basis 
of what a real relationship is. True. And they've been together for so long, but yet we want all the newfound freedoms that have come along with today's society. And we, we've been taught to be yourself and do your own thing and no one wants to live in anybody else's shadow. So I don't think it's wrong. I think in every generation there's yin and yang, but I think it's we almost have to get rid of this notion that our grandparents' era was the basis of what a relationship exactly is because it just doesn't match up with a lot of people's um, direction in life these days. So I think it's the morals part of it, yes. Yeah. But I think the way relationships are handled Completely and, you different. know, female um, and, you know, women's rights and all that stuff, mm. which is great, has evolved so much. So we're still finding our, our feet with it all. But I think we just need to rethink what a relationship is to us. We have this notion of, that is a relationship and that's what it's in that box and we're still holding on to that concept so i think more than ever these days it's not what is a relationship it's what is the relationship to you right and i think there's so much individualism you need to find someone that matches what a relationship is to you Correct. rather than trying to fit into this box of our grandparents era of that's, that's what a relationship is that's so. a great advice. Um, and so tell me a little bit about, you know, I, I want to ask you about what do you think, you know, you meet someone, right? And how do you differentiate for you anyways, love and infatuation, right? What can you define the two? And can you tell me a little bit about how do you know you're infatuated and you're excited and it's just that excitement phase and how do you know you're really in love with someone and this is real love? Uh, I'm a believer that once you feel that feeling with someone, mm -hmm. you have to go with your head. So I say go with your heart but take your brain with you. That's smart. Because <laughs> if, if you're just going with your heart, and there's that moment with the heart, you know, even in all religious texts, the heart can be very deceiving as well. Right. So this thing that we feel may not always be coming from the best place or your higher consciousness. It could actually be coming from insecurities. You might be insecure at that time and just be attaching to someone because of the way they look. Right. It could be lust. And I think when you feel like you're going a little bit crazy and you're, you're obsessing over someone, I think that's infatuation and that's lust. And I think when someone makes you feel comfortable, again, mm -hmm. don't think it's boring. Mm -hmm. That's the way you're meant to feel. You're right. meant to feel comfortable. You're meant to, of course, we all want those butterflies. Like yeah. We all want to have that feeling. And we're like, I, I wouldn't be with someone unless I had that feeling with them and I, you know, I really wanted to see her again. And I was excited to see her because guys do right. get that as well. Yeah. As much as you, as much as you think we're all statues, <laughs> we get that, and we ring up and we ring up our friends about it, and we're like, <laughs> I met this amazing girl, and I want to take her out again. Yeah. You know? And so we all, you know, we all feel that. We all right. want that. But there's always a but. You need to really yeah. take a deep breath and be like, I've learned my lessons from my previous relationships. I'm not going to run when I should be walking. And I really need to go with my brain here. And does this person give me what I need? And can I give them what they need? I think this is where it comes down to. I think it comes down to a need thing, not just a want. Right. Because we can always want someone that we're infatuated with, but. Yeah. And I feel like. Do when, they give us what we need in someone? Right. And when you're in a relationship or marriage or whatever it is, um, you know, there's always that butterfly stage, right? Where everything's exciting and all of that. And then that wears away. And then, you know, not necessarily the boredom stage comes, but it's sort of like that stage where you're just super comfortable and just nothing exciting is sort of happening. So yeah, how yeah. do you, how do you, how do you differentiate between, okay, this is, I'm, this is not giving me what I need emotionally and mentally and sort of like, no, this is, you know, there, it's a good relationship. I'm generally happy, but I'm bored. Like, what is your advice on that? I feel, I feel like the, the, the two of I, them are just, yeah. yeah. I think the first thing is do not act irrationally. Right. If you have something going on with someone, that's yeah. great. I think you have to really, really question why you are feeling like that. 
I've yeah. had I've met people who are in their late forties, mm-hmm. early fifties who are going crazy over younger guys, younger girls, right. and literally, literally left their family um, because they didn't have that feeling anymore. You know, uh, and I'm no one to judge and say that that's that and was that's a called wrong midlife decision, crisis, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I haven't had one yet, but but I will say, but I will say that, but I will say that. Yeah. Are they more fulfilled in their life? Are they happier now? I would say no, and I've and I've seen that so many times, where it's like, okay, you're not happy with that person, but why? You need to dig deep and really see, like, can you try to save this? And I'm always some. If that person is a great person you need to communicate and you need to do absolutely everything that you can to make it work. And then if it doesn't, that's when you can make a decision accordingly. But I think that you need to really question yourself and why you feel like this and Mm -hmm. maybe even take some time apart and talk to that person or whatever. But I think we're just, we're, we're living in a world where momentary happiness is the, the, uh, the pinnacle it's like we're True. always looking for this this next Fast fix. And you know, what is this next? Right. That's right. It's like sometimes we just have to be content with what life is. And so, life so just you, so you're is. saying it's being bored always. is a good thing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that sometimes I'm saying that sometimes peace is good. It is. It is. And I I'm I saying feel, that sometimes peace yeah. is great. It's not always it's not always um, a negative thing to feel at peace with your situation or True. comfortable because I think this is where we get it wrong. It's like, oh, wait, hold on. This is boring now. And you look at like divorce rates and people splitting up and there's obviously multiple reasons why people get divorced. True. Um, and some of you really have to, you know, if there's domestic violence involved and all that stuff, that's just a no-go. But there's, you know, so many times where people just leave and yeah. then, you know, we're still holding on to our grandparents here. It was like they didn't just leave. Yeah. I'm not saying that they, they're happy, they, but you're like, they oh, it's fought so it cute. Through it's and- so cute. They're yeah. ninety, yeah. They're ninety years old, and they've been together for fifty <laughs> years. Like, what do you think they? What do you think they went through? Yeah, you know, yeah. what do you think they went through? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure you know they've been there too. But I feel like we're in a society where everything is fast and everything is just quick satisfaction, right? And you know, we tend yeah. to forget that it's okay sometimes to be home and to be bored and to maybe bored is the wrong word. I don't know. Maybe I'm using it in the wrong content yeah. but um, oh, i think you got to do something that excites you do something that right. excites you go and go and you know that's another thing it doesn't just have to be maybe with that other person right it could just be you maybe you need a new hobby maybe you need to take something up maybe you need to do something new right so yeah and maybe yeah. involve your partner you know as well if they will like i think that's another great thing that's true absolutely um so i want to talk a little bit about um rejection and I'm sure, you know, you've gone through that so many times, whether it's your relationships or books or, you know, all of that. What is your take on reading? Yeah. Yeah. And we all have, I'm sure we've all been rejected in our lives at some point. How do you deal, Daniel, with rejection? Not always great. I'll be honest. We don't we don't always deal with it great. And that's just the reality. Nobody does. There's no one on this earth that always deals with rejection. Great big actresses, famous people, billionaires, millionaires, right. it doesn't matter. You see people constantly can fall into a pit and um, hit rock bottom because of rejection. You know, people break up with you, whatever it is. I think the way that I deal with it specifically is to always remember that nobody, and this is going back to the dating space as well, right? that nobody is ever that good is it, this is always, even if you're getting rejected from a job or whatever, nobody is ever that good for mm-hmm. you to feel that your life is not worth every single bit that it is and that you're not worthy. This is always a reflection of yourself. It's never about how good that person is. When you, when you, become to, when you get to a point where you hit rock bottom because you've been rejected, that's always because of the relationship you have with yourself. It's never a reflection of how good that person is. Mm -hmm. It's always a reflection of the relationship you have with yourself. This always goes back to self-love. When you have a great relationship with yourself and you love yourself, that is when 
no matter what comes at you, no matter how many times you get rejected, you can brush it off quicker and you won't spiral out of control. So I think yeah. the way to deal with rejection is to always look inward. Yeah. And, you know, the same goes for, for heartbreak. So, you know, we're going to have a lot of listeners here. And, you know, I have, I have a whole bunch of friends that are going through a lot right now. So mm. how did you deal with your heartbreak? And what is your advice on, you know, there's different stages, right? When you break up with someone, there's the, the hate stage, there's the, all of that. And then it's, you know, we've all been through it. And so what is your take on heartbreak and how do you pick yourself back up and, and, and do this all over again? I think heartbreak is one of the greatest phenomenons to ever grace life. And I You're say so that positive about it. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Not when I'm going through it and I'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> not, not always, I'll get to that. So but I, elaborate but on heartbreak reflect. for me. So. Yeah, yeah. So when you reflect on it, yeah. you see that you know, just how amazing that time is because it, it's a phenomenon in its own way because this future that you have created in your mind with someone is like smashed into a million pieces. So it's right. really the future that you believe that you were going to have has now been destroyed. So that means you can be reborn and you end up becoming reborn and that's how it feels when you get over it. And my process of going through any breakup is to go through it. I don't try to fast track anything. I'm a big believer in feel what you need to feel, you know, do what you have to do, cry as much as you want to cry, scream as much as you want to scream, right. feel angry, feel yeah. egotistical, feel it all. <laughs> right. Don't always express it. <laughs> That's nothing. Don't always ring them don't. up and abuse them. But no, don't do that. But yes. feel it within yourself and write stuff down and you know, they always say, write everything that you feel down. Just Correct. don't don't push send, you know. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. push send to everything. But, but write <laughs> just, it down. Just write it and leave get, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, get it out. Get it out yeah. and just do whatever you need to do to get through it. And I think that's the biggest thing. It's like people be like, get back to the gym. You know, you got to get back to the gym the next day and you have to do this the next day. It's like, that is so, you know, I don't even believe the people that are saying that actually did that. I don't believe that for one second, people acting like, you know, you just get back on the horse. You don't just yeah. get back on the horse. Yeah. This is this is a really big thing in life, probably one of the biggest things to ever happen to anybody. And it can really change you for the positive. And I think that's the, the beautiful thing about heartbreak is that when it's all said and done, you are this new 2.0 version of yourself. Well, you find you know, yourself and, through heartbreaks, uh, right? You, you, you really do because right. you're digging deep within yourself. And I feel like when you come out of it, you find this new person and you find yourself w through the heartbreak. Right. And I think that's why it's a, it's in the end, it could be a positive thing. Um, so sure. how do you, how do you deal with, you know, and this is another question that was brought up to me, but how do you deal with someone just walking away? What is your advice on that? When do you, when do you decide, okay, this is worth me fighting and when do you decide, you know what, someone walked away from me, they're not meant to be in my life, I'm gonna let it go. How do you yeah. differentiate so, between the two in your opinion? Mm, well, I'm a big believer in, and I've always done this, I will deal with the pain of someone walking away, but I will never chase them. Okay. And I'll never, ch and, I, and I'll tell you why. Even if you know will, in I your only heart, chase someone. Yeah, even if you know in your heart that maybe this is the right person for me, do you still, would you still right, just well, let it go? I've, I've got an answer for that. All right, an good. I'm waiting. So my, my, answer, my answer for that is that if I've done something wrong to that person and I know that I've done something wrong, I will chase them to the end of the earth to make it right. I will do everything in my power that's possibly able to get them back right. and to do everything to, to please them because I know that I did wrong. But if I know that I've done nothing wrong and that person's walked out of my life, voluntarily walked out then i don't think that they're the one at all and they they're, ne they're not meant to be so i'm a big believer in if someone walks out and you've done nothing wrong to make them walk out then let them go let them do go. not chase don't chase do, That's deal with the pain deal with everything deal with it all and i'm a, and i've and i do that you know people have walked out on me people have walked out on everyone in life I deal with the pain. I will deal with everything, but I will not chase. Maybe there's, 
you know, a few texts here and there back and forth or whatever, but there is, once they're gone, then they're not for me. They walked out, they left. Right. Not right. for you. They yes. would, I, I, I'm someone who, if I make a commitment to someone, if I make that commitment, I'm there forever. Yeah. We're doing this forever. Yeah. And you know? I'm, I'm with I, you I, on I'm, that. I'm, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a big believer yeah. so of left me, chasing, not chasing. Yeah. Yeah, Go. that's right. That you chase when you've done something wrong. When right. you've done nothing wrong, you don't chase anybody. That's, that's good advice. Um, and so tell me a little bit about, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your, the book and how, when, when the book came out, what was that like for you and what was the whole process and what was the energy that you got and all the, you know, all the feedback from your book? Uh, which book? Your, your, the modern breakup. The modern breakup. The modern breakup has had mixed reviews. We've had a lot. We've got like 8,000 reviews on Amazon. So the book did really well. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it went viral from, from a few different posts and it's just, yeah, it's, it's had a lot of success and I've been very happy with, with its success. Yeah. But I guess some people maybe thought it was, um, a self-help book which mm -hmm. it, it is to a certain degree, but I think they've picked it up thinking it's a self-help book and then realizing that it's actually a, a self-help book intertwined in a fictional story. Right. So some people are a little bit chuckled at that because they don't read fiction, you know, they only yeah. read non-fiction. They so expected it, had a lot it to of those. be more. Oh, I picked this yeah. up. I read the quotes online yeah. and I thought this was going to be a non-fiction, whatever, but it's like all you had to do was read the categories or, you know, whatever. <laughs> see that this character's named <laughs> you, you Amelia. You should have so read the back there. of the it's book. <laughs> That's yeah. right. That's right. It's not that hard. But anyway, it's all good. I, I love everybody who comments and who gives feedback because it means it impacted them somehow. Um, but it's mainly been positive and people have been really connecting with the book and saying that the book is basically um, them. The book is them. And it's like I've taken their life oh, and described awesome. it. How? Yeah. So I, I and I feel like that's because when we go within ourselves and we mm -hmm. really discover things about ourselves and we express um, as naturally as we possibly can, then people are going to feel it because we're all human beings and we all go through the same thing. So I never wanted to sugarcoat anything in the book. And I think that's coming through to the readers. I just wanted it to be raw. I wanted it to be real. And I just didn't want to sugarcoat anything. And I think yeah, they felt that. They that's felt great. That. And, and how do you deal, you know, how, how do you deal with criticism? So, you know, when you, when you put yourself out there, obviously, whether it's Instagram or whether it's a book or whatnot, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of criticism. So how do you deal with that? How, you know, with people saying it wasn't a great book or, it, you know, or it wasn't all that good or even, you know, with certain things that you post and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Because I'm sure, and a lot of criticism sometimes comes from close friends and family, not necessarily strangers. How do you deal with that? Well, I, first of all, I don't read much of it, but when I do, I so actually do you think ignore to myself, all your like. Do you not I, really I, I get into the, your? Nah, it depends. It depends. Yeah. So with criticism, with when it's people right. that I don't know, I know that they don't know me, right? And they're allowed to have any opinion that they want. It actually really doesn't get to me. That's um, good. I think what stops us in life is the criticism of people that are around us, and a lot of the time, it's in our it's in our mind because we know that there's certain people around us that are judging yeah. us. And I think you got to really dig deep about those people and realize that they're probably not meant to be in your life. Even if they are close friends, you got to distance yourself because if you're feeling like that, you should ha always have people around you that you feel are not judging you and you can post whatever you want and be whoever you want. And they will accept that because they know who you really are deep down rather than being like, but I know who you really are because they want right. to hold on to this past notion of, of you because yeah. they've got insecurities and they don't really want you to grow because then it's a reflection yeah. of the lack of growth that they're having in their life. And they're a lot of the time people that are closest to you. So a lot of the times we don't put things out there because of people that are closest to us and what we think they're going to think about us. It's not about people that we don't know. So the people that I don't know and that criticize me, I'll take back their criticism sometimes, like an editor, for example, there's that kind of criticism where if you just ignore everything and think you're right about everything, you're never going to grow and your script is never going to be amazing because you have to take everything in. And that was a big learning lesson with the modern breakup. When I got all the notes back, I was like, I still kept a lot of stuff that they wanted me to change. But I also looked at it and said, I know this deep down. I right. knew that was right deep down. Yeah. So I think it's a very egotistical point of view to come across and say, I'm not going to listen to what anyone has to say. Yeah. 
because I don't think we grow and evolve that way. True. And I, I think I, we should listen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it I hurts think more and, and it really, in. it really hurts more and it, it, it bugs you more when it's coming from a friend or a family member or someone close to you in your circle. Right. And I think that's it's yeah. when people judge you for what you're doing or for growing or putting yourself out there. I think that's when it really hurts because those are the, exactly what you're saying. Those are the people that really know who you are. They know you're a good person deep down inside. They know that you're trying to do good. But yeah, they're just sitting yeah. behind their phones and computers and judging. And I think that's the well, really... I think that there's a... Yeah. I think there's a difference between judgment right. and giving feedback. Yeah. I think there's a very big difference. And you know when someone's judging you. You know when someone is kicking you while you're down or, yeah. you know, saying things to you that really don't make you feel good and there's no real constructive criticism there. That's coming from a really dark place within them. And I've got that feeling from people that I thought were extremely close to me and I've had it many times and I'm a very loyal person so I stuck these friendships out. But eventually I had to distance myself a bit because I felt that there wasn't that purity as much as that I would give them, you know. So right. there's and definitely a difference with criticism and mm -hmm. judgment and, and feedback right. from someone that loves you. And feedback is different. I mean, it's different when someone says, hey, you know, I read this or I saw this or I, I came across this from you and this is what I think. That's different. You know, this is feedback. And whether sure, it's good or sure. bad, it still is feedback. I think yeah. it's positive. But, you know, it's more when people talk about you behind your back, right? And especially when you're growing, and especially when you're, you're doing bigger and better things. And then I think that's when people around you that are close to you start to sort of want to hold on to the old you maybe or, or judge you and things like that. And that's the hard part, I think. And, yeah, and, for and sure, for letting sure. And go I of these people, yeah. it's, it's, not e it's not really an easy thing, but you do have to learn to do that and that it's okay to let go and not everybody's meant to be in your life forever. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And I yeah. think that's, that's one of the most important things. Yeah, 100%. Um, so tell me a little bit about what is next for you. What, what's on your, well, are, we, are we writing another book? Is there anything else that need, we need to watch out um, for? <laughs> I, there, 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 there could be a sequel to The Modern Breakup coming up. Oh, um, okay. I'm working, on it, I'm working on it lightly. I'm working on it lightly, but I've got some other things happening now. So I want to start doing more events, online events mm -hmm. as well, so I can, do, I can reach the, you know, the global market because there's so many people from around the world that we need to reach. Um, I want to do physical events as well. I have another business coming up mm -hmm. that I can't really say too much about at the moment okay because it ha actually hasn't been done yet no one's done it <laughs> no in one's, the world oh, yet. amazing yeah I found I not not that I believe that's where all, all great ideas end up evolving from because I think you can right. make a good idea great and that's what makes a great idea so but this one is sort of a little bit specific but I will I'll drop a little bit more on Instagram and give you a bit more. All as, right, give, as it give us a little hit, like hints and things like that. I like that. <laughs> little teasers. <laughs> That's exciting. And it's, uh, it's going to bring back some old school emotion. It's going to bring back some old school, old school emotion. That's, That's awesome. All. And and Something are you nice. are you planning any trips to the U.S. anytime soon? Yeah, I plan on uh, moving there actually okay. next year. All right. So maybe we'll have to redo this in the studio. We'll have to do podcast number two in the studio. We have to come down to OC. <laughs> well, I'm and so I'll, excited. And I'll tell you what the business is. Yes, yes. I want to know. I won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. <laughs> okay. Just on the podcast. We'll just sit on the podcast. Don't tell anyone. No, I won't tell anyone. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'll, I'd like to be on your podcast. We can, we can uh, like to come on and talk to you if as I well. Start one. Yes. yes, if you start one. Sure. So um, I'm so excited to have you on and thank you so much for waking up. What time did you have to wake up? At 5.30 a.m. I got you up. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was like, it was like 5.45. It's still dark People in Australia. People are going to be like, I do that all the time. It's like, I don't do that. I'm not going to try and trick anybody. I don't, I don't do that. I love that. And um, hopefully we'll get, I'll get to meet you in person. Um, we're planning actually a trip to Australia soon, so I'll, I'll be in touch. And when oh, you come we'll to up. L.A., you got to be in touch. And um, your book can be found on Amazon. Um, and your yep. Instagram as well. And I will share everything with our viewers and our listeners. And it was just, it was really an honor to have you here. Um, and we definitely have to do this again. So enjoy. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so, so much, much, Daniel. And enjoy the rest of your day.
Stay warm. You too. <laughs> oh, I'll right. try. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.